Say thank you, Lord Jesus. Thy loving kindness, O oh God. Thy loving kindness, Lord. Thy loving kindness, O oh God, is better than life to me. 
My lips will praise you, O God, thus will I bless you for all you've done for me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the wonderful works of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your manifest presence in our life. That brings joy unspeakable and full of glory. That brings peace that passes understanding. <laughs> the love that goes beyond all knowledge. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woohoo! Listen, just one glimpse of him, your whole life will be changed. Just one glimpse. People have been stuck in a prison of religion, trying to serve God with their intellect. Oh, but what a wonderful work of grace that comes when the Holy Ghost comes upon us, and creates within us a new heart and a new spirit so that we may know God. Hallelujah. The scripture says if our gospel is hid, it's hid from them who are lost. And today, we don't want the gospel that we're going to preach to you to be hidden from you. And it's not some esoteric, mystical thing. It's where God just comes in reality into our life, changes everything about our lives so that we can begin to have abundant life, so that we can walk in His love, walk in His joy, walk in His peace. It's not possible for anybody to even begin to realize Till a miracle takes place. Wonderful miracle of salvation. You know, by, by definition, I would call hell the absence of God's presence. But I look and I watch as many people go to church and participate in religious activities and they do not have the manifest presence of God in their life. So in reality, that's a dimension of hell. A lot of people live in a hell. A hell that God doesn't want anyone to live in, not now, nor in the future. Religion won't help you. Good deeds won't help you. So I said, well, why not? There's so many good things in, in religions. So many good things in Hinduism. A lot of bad things, too. So many good things in Buddhism. A lot of bad things, too. Well, why, why can't Islam help me? Why, why can't just making up my own God, and my own ideology and philosophy, why can't that help me? Why, why do you say that religion can't help me? Good deeds can't help me because it can't change you. You're going to be the same you after you finish with your good deeds. You're going to be the same you after you're done with your religious activities. But the power of God will come upon you and change you. And it is a reproducible change. It's not an imaginary change. And it has a witness. That change, the true change that comes by the power and the authority of the name of Jesus has a witness with it. The witness of the very presence of the living God. The manifest presence of God. That's unmistakable. I hear people talk all the time about how they, all they knew they were in the presence of evil. And they can feel the fear and the evil and this and that and the ugly thing and the bad thing. Well, my, my goodness, I'm going to tell you about the presence of God for just a minute. It goes far beyond feeling the presence of any other, any other thing or any other experience. Today, God has purposed that all men be saved. Saved from a life of hell. Save them from a life of selfish interest earthly pursuits that will get you nowhere just on the treadmill of what we call existence. God's got for us a heavenly realm to live in right now. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Today we pray in Jesus' mighty name that every one of you come to know this wonderful thing that God did for us when God, the eternal word, left all of his riches and became poor for our sake. Left all of his glory. And one day, he was incarnated into a holy embryo. The power of the Holy Ghost 
the power of the Holy Spirit. Mean bad things have been said about the Holy Ghost. Mean things have been done in His name that He never did. But I'll tell you one thing for certain that He did. He overshadowed a woman, a young virgin named Mary in a family that had been separated for the sole purpose of His coming. God found a man named Avram, who you, everyone calls Abram, who ultimately became Abraham or Avraham. And he separated him as a family to be consecrated unto him so he could bring forth a Savior, my Savior. He saved me. He saved my daddy, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. As far back as I know, we just a bunch of preachers. And some families are just that way, I reckon. You can be seated. Some families just... My great-aunt said one day, said, my goodness, you... She's talking about, talking about some of my cousins who marine biologists and organic chemists. People get lost up in intellectualism. God, one of the gods of this world today, one of the idols of this world, people don't even realize that it's intellectualism. It's an angelic power that deceives men. A realm of deception. And I'm not talking from some place of ignorance either. You know, there's wonderful, th I love education, I love knowledge, I, I'm still learning, I, I, I love studying new things, but I also understand around where men become absorbed with the pride of life, they come, become absorbed with ever-changing ideologies, they get lost in the perception of facts and forsake truth, but at any rate, Back to what I was saying about my cousins. My great aunt came to him one day. They were saying how that, you know, th there is no God and we got it all figured out now. And, uh, well, my great aunt just said, well, it's just in your blood. You're going be before long, you're going to have to acknowledge the living God. And this is what Father would that all men acknowledge. His great love for us. Can you imagine a love that would come for the sake of your redemption? Lay aside all of his riches, all of his glory. Subject, subjugate himself to the mockery and the scandal and the rejection. And the, the best men can give is misunderstanding. Can, no one can comprehend or understand who he is. Yet in the midst of all of that, he opens up the eyes of the blind. Many infallible proofs on this. Many infallible proofs, and I'm going to tell you why. Because many of the most ultra-Orthodox Jews of the day, if you've ever known ultra-Orthodox Jews, they're hard to persuade. Many of the ultra-Orthodox Jews of the day made up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first century. In fact, the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ was made up but nothing but people, Hebrews, that men come to call those who are of Jewry or Jews. Um, they had many infallible proofs of this one who claimed to be the only begotten Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, who then went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed with the devil, opening up the eyes of the blind, saying to the paraplegic walk, and then when everybody's all upset, saying, what is it easier to forgive sin or to say to take up your bed and walk? Because they all understood that the priest had a right or a ministry where they could forgive sin once a year during what we call Yom Kippur the day of purgation. And so he's saying to this man, your sins be forgiven you. And then some of the people who were just more bent on the religion, people, see some people only have a heart for religion, for self-interest. They're all wrapped up in their philosophy and ideology. And they can't see God if you're standing and looking at them, breathing on them. Because they, they imprisoned They're blinded. The God of this world has blinded them. Those who are lost are blinded. They cannot see. It 
So though he made the cripple to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, brought liberation to those who are in prison by torment, like the man of Gadar the, or the man of the Gadarenes who was in the tombs and as a wild man cut himself. Living in torment. Christ Jesus comes personally to him, casts all of that torment out, commands all those powers of darkness to leave. Because his heart's so set on liberating men, God who would have all men to be saved. He's the only one who can forgive sin. He's the only one who has the power to change the heart of men. Father has, has given all power and authority in his name. And that's reproducible. It's provable over, uh, provable over and over again. Many infallible proofs. A man named Saul of Tarsus, who we, call, who we come to know as Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. A man who was in the inner circle of the Pharisees of the day, the keepers and the upholder of the Mosaic law, has an encounter with Jesus to realize who is the Redeemer of all men, who is the Savior of the soul, the one by whom all men must be saved, and by, without Him no man can be saved, because there is no other power that can change the heart and state of man. Many infallible proofs. Come on in. Have a seat. An infallible proof that is still has the same reproducible evidence today as it did then. Now, if you look around in churches and you look around in religious circles, you're not going to see much of that. You're not going to really see much of joy unspeakable and full of glory. You're going to see people trying to serve God with their intellect. Trying to know God with their mind. They've never been captivated and raptured into a realm which Christ Jesus is the door and access in which we can go into. There's only one power that can re erase and remove. Yeah, just go ahead and find the most comfortable seat. We can find, we, we, listen, he, he will erase and remove every sin, every transgression, every situation that would keep you or hold you back from this wonderful interaction with the living God. Can you imagine that you today could actually have the opportunity to step into the realms of the living God through the door of Christ Jesus and leave all your torment and sorrow and hurt and discouragement and disappointment, which was all created out of the realm of make-believe anyways. So it is not make-believe, it really happened. It's make-believe. What really happened? What, somebody got upset at you? You didn't get the job you wanted to get? You lost the money you had? You didn't make as much as you wanted to? What is it? What is it? Because most of the stuff just consists of that. Most of our problems, are you with me? Somebody said something. They didn't really say it. You just thought they said it, but you spent your whole life bitter because you thought somebody said something. Right? You felt you had the proofs and the evidence and your whole life was a prison. Nuts. No sense to that. If our gospel is hid, it's hid from those that are lost. Let me tell you about our gospel. Our gospel is that God came into this world to die for sinners. Our gospel is that God was made flesh so that you and I could understand the kind of life that he created us to have. Our gospel is that Christ Jesus, through his blood, changed the heart of men and the spirit of men. And Jesus said, and when he was talking to one of the rulers of the Jews, and really you could say the ruler of the Jews, in John chapter 3, a man named Nicodemus, and Nicodemus comes to him and said, We know that you are a teacher sent from God, for no one can do what you have done unless God be with him. It's impossible for anybody to do the miracles you've done. Jesus didn't say, Well, thanks, Nicodemus, for recognizing who I am. You know, I feel like you're getting close now. You know, would you like to join the church? 
Would you like to come be my disciple? He just looks at him. He's very, just, he's very pointed in all the things that he ever said. He looked at him and said, you cannot come into a place of knowing God until you're born again. Wait a minute. He's in the right religion. He's got the right covenant. He's in the right family. He loves God with all of his heart. So many people say, oh, I love God with all my heart. You do. Oh, yes, I do. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Huh? God said that they come near me when their mouth sound, with the things that they say in their mouth, it, 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 it sounds good, but their hearts are far from me. They will not listen to my words. They will not keep my ways. They won't keep my statutes. They won't, they won't honor the laws of life. They won't walk in love. They won't give themselves over to this place <laughs> of living in this goodness of the life that I created. Jesus says to him, you cannot come in, Nicodemus, until you're born again. Nicodemus, immediately his mind, because he knows all of the law and the prophets, because he, he had to memorize it. It was the, part, it was the one way, to get, it was the one way to, to get a little closer to God, is if you more scripture you memorize, the closer you get to God. So he memorized it all. His mind immediately goes to Jeremiah 31, 33, it immediately goes to Ezekiel 36, 26. Ah, oh, a new covenant will I give you in those days. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, says the Lord. I'll take away your stony heart, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, a sensitive heart, that you may know me. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I'll put my spirit in you, says the Lord. I'll write my laws upon your heart and upon your mind that you may do them. Pretty radical stuff. It's, it's, all your scriptures coming alive. As Jesus said, Nicodemus, you can't interact with God. You can't come into the kingdom. We're not talking about in the sweet by and by. Because until what you've got right now is what you're going to have. And, then, and, it's not gonna, and it may not be the sweet by and by. It may be the terrible by and by. The only sweet by and by is knowing the living God. We, I mean, listen... I tell you, I love to celebrate the things of the kingdom of God, but there is nothing like allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of your being, of your emotions, of your attitudes and your appetites as He fills you and floods you with a joy and a peace and a love that is so ecstatic that only those people who know how to yield to that realm can really celebrate God and worship God and have a good time. And those who live in that have no place for sin. Sin comes along and it just doesn't look very good. It ju there's just no room to accommodate a devil. And yet religion points a finger and says, look at these guys, they're all emotional. No, no, been touched by God and you can't contain it. Been touched by God and you can't contain it. I was recently, recently watching a meeting that took place back in the, uh, <laughs> back in the 70s. And... Um, a wonderful gift that God had given to the church. He's not alive anymore. And there's probably about 10,000 people in the meeting. And he would just walk around ministering, you know, just talking to people. And of course, it was one of the big camp meetings. And so it's where everybody gets together from different churches all around. A bunch of, you know, famous preachers on the front row. And man, and God walks by one of the, one of the preachers and the guest of honor that was there very dignified person from outward appearance. But of course, soon as the Holy Ghost touches him in that wonderful way that you can't, can't, cannot contain, you get undignified real quick. <laughs> David, king of Israel, got very undignified when he was bringing up the Ark of the Covenant into Israel because of the power and the glory and the Spirit of the Lord. When the Spirit of the Lord moves upon my heart, you know, and, uh, of course, you know, the king's daughter said, look at how he behaves himself for the young women of Israel. Oh, how immodest. He said, I'll be more immodest still. 
Watch what happens. I don't, I'm, and if forgot about you, I just access the realms of glory. I just access the realms of life. Well, at any rate, and then a guy got too close to the preacher. Preacher jumps up, leaps. I never seen anything like this. Leaps up on a pulpit about this high, dances on the pulpits. <laughs> jumps off the pulpit, lands in the planter <laughs> behind the pulpit. And they go, ah, emotionalism. No, you just don't know what's, you, you're, the gospel, this gospel is hit from you. You're lost. You don't know. You've been excited about things. You've been, you've been made really happy, jumping up down happy because somebody told you you just won the lottery or whatever. <laughs> or just won, you know, $5. I don't know what it <laughs> Or just got bingo, bingo, bingo. <laughs> That's weird. Standing up there. <laughs> Come on now, man. Listen to me. Setting up in a football game, your face painted all these kinds of colors. <laughs> that is verifiably insanity. <laughs> that is weird. <laughs> and you, you know, I'm not going to get into that. At any rate, some of the other bishopric, the bishops that were there, went to fish him out of the planter. It's about 10,000 people there. They're all standing up looking at this because, man because everybody knows who, he's it, who he is and they're just shaking their head going, what on earth is happening in this place? And uh, says, some of the bishops go fish him out of the planter. <laughs> so they get him out. And as soon as they touched him, the power of God came upon them and they started jumping around like I was jumping around in here last night. <laughs> See, I have to have one night where I can worship God without a bunch of criticism. I, that's Saturday night. You know, three or four or five people come. <laughs> then I get my guitar and get the worship team and I get to go to worship. And I you know, just do it. I think it lasted for about, I don't know what, two and a half hours last night. Th did we do more than one song? I think maybe did two. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I said, we want to do a school of worship. We'll do a school of worship. We'll just get lost in the glory. Watch this. Watch this. And you, it's captivating. It's not you got to do it. It's not some kind of a legalistic form. It's like, oh, my goodness, we're so bored stiff. How long have we been doing this? You're just <laughs> we're raptured, captivated. It's, and think about the thing that you've done that, you know, where just hours went by in a snap. I found a place in God of walking with the Lord where just captivated not one, two hours, three, four, five hours. 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year for the rest of your lifetime, throughout the ages to come. Time immeasurable. That's what's eternal. So we talk about eternal life. Well, it's, it's, it's forever life. It's life without end. And it's more than something that is quantitative. It's more than, it's more than something that is a quantity. It's a quality. You don't want the quantity without the quality. Who wants to live miserable for the rest of the life? You're going to live for the rest of your life. Miserable or not. Somebody said, well, how can a loving God create a hell? Because you didn't understand something. The way an eternal torture chamber is, 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 is thought of and imagined by you, well, that's how sin is imagined by God. The most unbelievable unimaginable, most horrific, abominable thing that could possibly be conceived by God. This is his revelation, his sin. To abuse other people, to live your life in self-interest, and strife and envy and bickering and fighting and fussing and cursing malice. I'm glad Father not allow that disease to continue on. I love the cure of disease. I love the moment of discovery where the disease is now cured, is eradicated. Hallelujah. God created life forever and the only way it can be forever is that there's covenant and there's love. There's ongoing love, a happy love. My wife and I have happy love. <laughs> we do. We do. It's amazing. And it's not a struggle. 
Because we're not obligated in that sense. Uh, we just can't live without each other. We're stuck on each other. I mean, we just belong to each other. Just. But she belongs to someone else more than she belongs to me. Then I belong to someone else more than I belong to her. And that's a lot of what makes this work. Because our relationship with him fills us with a love that is not accepted. You can't have it until you know him. You can pretend to have it. You can say you have it. You can know the scriptures about it. You can discuss it. You can debate it. But until you know him, you can never have it. It can never be a reality in your life. And when it's a reality in life, there's proofs. There's evidence. It's no pretend. It's no make-believe. It's yours. And everybody can see it's yours. And it's happy all the day. And it's rejoice forevermore. And it's laying down your life for other people. And it's a joy to do it, to live the life of servitude. You know, I was talking about the way that marriage is supposed to work. And a, a, a person face message me and said, well, if marriage is supposed to be that way, I don't want to ever be have, get married. It sounds like too much sacrifice and work and having to give up too much. I said, when, when you fall in love, it won't be any problem. When you fall in love, it won't be any problem. See, the Holy Spirit came and poured the love of God into our hearts. The very moment that we called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he, the Father's forcing nobody. He lays it out there. Listen, everything of the invisible power of God is right now revealed by those things which are visible. And I could lay out the proofs of that thesis, but I'm not going to do it because I'm talking about something else. But it's the Word of God and it stands up and it holds, and it holds up to every kind of analysis and evaluation. And all you'd have to do is be a little bit more knowledgeable. All you'd have to do is have a little bit more understanding and you'd be able to see that quickly. But God didn't leave it. Salvation to how smart we are. How perceptive we are. What our IQ is. Or praise God, EQ, either one. And I think most people really fell there. Those are inversely proportional to one another, by the way. He just made it so available that this, the, 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 most, the most ignorant, unlearned person can just call upon the name of Jesus in a sincere and true heart. They don't have to know the Bible. Just say, Jesus! All they got to hear is me preach or someone like me preach and say to them, today you can come into the kingdom of God simply by calling upon the name of Jesus Christ with a true and sincere heart. And I've watched tens of thousands of Hindus run to the altar. True. I've watched tens of thousands of jungle people in Papua New Guinea run to the altar. One day it's going to happen again here. Because the pride of America is going to be taken away. In God's mercy, grace, people have lost themselves in the grocery stores. They've lost themselves in their jobs, in their careers. They've lost themselves in their cars and houses and boats, in their false security. They've lost themselves. They've imagined that they are the creator of their own destiny. God's made a way of, of escape because the whole world lies under sin and under the control of a demon power. Angelic forces of darkness that rebelled against Almighty God. Somebody said, well, I don't understand that. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a list of things that... You don't understand that none of us understand. And we, 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 we work with it every day. Those lights behind me, those lights right there, just one of them. And the discovery of things that we benefit from every day. Very few people really understand how it works. Very few people really understand photonics. 
Very few people understand the mechanisms by which we enjoy a whole lot of co comfort and convenience. Then that doesn't stop you from using them. <laughs> Reality of it is, we may not understand all the things that happened so long ago that resulted in our condition and state right now, but this one thing we can, every one of us know, that if you call upon the name of Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth, everything about your life and your heart will change. Everything. Because God's very, God's committed and faithful to His promise. Jesus died and went down into hell for three days. And there he broke every stronghold of sin and iniquity. Through that wonderful work of grace, he rose up from the third day, having the keys of death and hell. Hallelujah. And he stands right now as the judge of all mankind. And he said, as the judge of all mankind, the one whom God will judge both the living and the dead, he says, my word will judge you. And Father has given to us a privilege of having his word. Somebody said, what translation? It doesn't really matter. It'll get it, whatever translation. Well, how do you know it's the original one? It is. And believe me, that has been investigated more over the past 200 years with more people dedicated to textual criticism than can even be imagined. And every rigorous analysis finds it in the, in the, in the very worst sense, in the very worst case, 92% accurate of all extant manuscripts. It's, it's, it's original. And reality of it is, that's, it's not that case, it's not that bad. It's, it's, it's more, it's 99 plus percent. All hom homogeneity, homology between all the ex existing manuscripts. This is it. Read it. Open it up. Read it. God's watched over His Word. It's been preserved. The investigation of the archaeologist, the investigation of the anthropologist, the investigation of the linguist, the, the investigation of the textual critic. Uh, criticism and critique. Here's the Word of God. What are you going to do with it? Very few people know this word. You say it's number one bestseller. Well, it's probably the number one less read. It's a big, it's a, it's a, you're, are you with me? It's a paradox, isn't it? You don't know how many people who've stepped into this church, come in, that I, that I have encountered, God has touched them, their lives have been changed, and they started reading the Bible going, my goodness, I didn't realize how off I was. I'm Everybody can testify that it's in here right now. Would you raise your hand? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you've been taught religion all your life. Philosophy, idea just philosophy, ideologies. Christian philosophy, prevalent. Open up the Bible, start reading it. Oh, then somebody said, oh, you can't, you can't take it literal. If you can't take it literal, where do you get your information? <laughs> what, you got some special, you, you, did you write a book? God, you, God spoke directly to you? Now you got a Bible, you got a secret Bible back there? It's your referencing? Huh? <laughs> it's, it's like the doc. You walk in the doctor's office, he takes a few notes on you, you know, family history, how you've been feeling, and then he goes and sticks it in the computer and says, <laughs> okay, here's a list of possibilities. He comes walk out like the all-knowing. I, I think there's a possibility you may have. Give me a break, right? And that's what, what somebody's going to do. They're going to go, in, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna go into their little, they're going to go into their little database of various different philosophical beliefs and they're going to extract things from that and then they're going to tell me that that's what God has to say and that's, what, that's what's going to make the difference in my life. Okay, okay. Then let's try that out. Let's see if that works. First of all, I want to see how did that work on you? Did it work for you? And, uh, and you can see that in many cases people espouse things. They didn't change them. It didn't work for them. They're as miserable as anybody else. They're still in the same rut everybody else. In. They're still going for the same kind of, you know, sedatives that everybody else is going for. Are you with me? 
And then next, I mean, if it did work for them, then it should, then, and, and it's God, and he's the one who has, would that all men be saved, and he's the one who died for us so that we could have a heart change that is going to work for me too. But how many things did evil signed up for and didn't change nothing? Didn't produce nothing. Well, then scratch that. Go back to the Word, hear what God says in His Word, and start saying, get real with God. Say, I want this in my life. I'm tired of having the excuses for myself of why I don't have the real thing. Because I'm going to tell you right now, God's going to demand change of your life. A change that you can never produce. A change that can only take place because you have had a re real miracle from heaven. And you received a new heart and you received a new spirit and he put a spirit on the inside of you because you were born again. And make no mistake, what Jesus was saying was radical because Nicodemus said, how can a man when he's old enter the second time into his mother's womb? What are you talking about? Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh, that which is born of a man and a woman is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit that which is born of the Holy Ghost, that which is born of God. <laughs> well, that is a whole new realm of living. That, that is born of the Spirit. It is produced and created by the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is, I want there to be a new creation, a creation that is by the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, the miracle of salvation, the same word that formed the universe. Behold him, I'm telling you, dear people, you can have a relationship with him that defies everything that you've imagined up to this point. I tell you, you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. You don't have to be miserable anymore. You do not have to be diseased anymore. There is so much anxiety and mental disease in our modern society than, I, than it truly has ever been recognized and probably more than has ever existed because of the unique stresses and challenges. I mean, Dennis tell me that they're making, um, they're making millions off of this little plastic thing that people put on their teeth at night because everybody's grinding their teeth down by morning. There's nothing left but gums because <laughs> they're all having a great time. Are you with me? From stress. <laughs> All night long. Grinding. Ouch. I get to go to sleep. Sleep the sleep of the righteous. I lay me down in this wonderful peace and comfort of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Somebody tell you need a crutch. No, I am totally dependent. I'm totally dependent. I, I'm totally dependent upon God. I mean, a crutch, I could get along half on my own, half on the crutch or something like that. I'm totally dependent. Because nothing about my life was acceptable. Nothing about my life was acceptable to God. Nothing. And there's absolutely no way to find a remedy or a cure for any sin that you've ever committed because you're going to commit them again and again and again and again. And even if, you could, even if you could find a cure for your sin of the past, you're going to do it again and you're going to do it again and you're going to do it again until your heart's changed. That's right. You know, everybody doesn't like God for His judgments, His righteous judgments and punishments until something bad happens to them. Then when somebody breaks through and, 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 and steals something from you or violates you or harms something that you have or you watch somebody get away with murder, then you're crying out, hey, that's un unjust. Yeah, now, now, we're, now you're preaching. Now you're preaching. Moment of sanity. All of my friends that, and people that I've known and people that I've heard of that have been on the battlefield, he said, there's no atheist or agnostic on the battlefield. you got to get back into the comfort of home base for somebody to be an agnostic again or an atheist. But when you're under fire, everybody's crying out for God, help! Because deep inside, everyone knows where we came from. Deep inside, everyone knows. Deep inside, everyone knows what's wrong. Deep inside, people know the difference between good and evil. 
Deep inside, everybody knows that evil should never be allowed. It needs to be erased. It needs to be removed. Deep inside, everyone knows it. Create falsehoods and imaginations for your own mind. False worlds to live in. False belief systems that defy the Word of God so that you can salve your own conscience and keep from coming under conviction of the Holy Ghost. To ultimately have your heart hardened to no longer even be reachable. God calls all men everywhere to repent. He commands it. And that repentance is a gift that He's granted to you and me in the name of Jesus. You don't have to be sad anymore. You don't have to be unhappy anymore. You don't have to live under oppression anymore. You don't have to be distraught anymore. You don't have to live under addictions anymore. You don't have to live in heartache anymore, in torment anymore. You don't have to live with mental diseases anymore. You don't have to live with physical diseases of any sort, any kind. Ruthie Anna went to the dentist the other day and he said, my goodness, how is it that your bones and gums are so good you don't go to the dentist? She said, well, I don't speak evil of anybody and I go to church. <laughs> and of course, the dentist, I, the dentist is a, a close friend of mine from back in the mid-80s. So he knows, oh, he knows her daddy's a preacher and... Get the sin out of your life. Get the wrongdoing. Quit treating people wrong. Quit living unethical. Based on God's ethics, not man's. Huh? Start doing what's right. And you're going to be healthy. And you're going to be blessed. Let me tell you how to live in heaven. Get rid of the leaven and you'll live in heaven. Get rid of the leaven and you'll live in heaven. You'll understand and experience all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. Get rid of the leaven and you'll live in heaven. People want to hang on to the living. It's the living of sin, and it's the living of false doctrine. Get rid of the living, you'll go right into heaven. Somebody say, I'm not in heaven, because you've got living. Because God made a way for you and I to step into the realms of heaven. Jesus caused us to be seated together with him in a heavenly realm. He is the door and access into that realm of heaven. Paul said we've been translated from the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of the dear son, Colossians 1.13. Of course, you know, all these verses of Scripture that I'm quoting off without giving you the reference... We have a place where you can get the, all the scripture references for today. They're actually being published right now as I'm speaking. Isn't that cool? So they might go look up for themselves. You should devote yourself to reading the Bible. Once your heart's changed, it won't mean nothing to you without a changed heart. Do I believe that, do I believe that someone could ultimately have a changed heart? By reading the Bible? Absolutely. You get serious. Most people get serious because they want to disprove it. Bad approach. <laughs> but if you go to disprove something and you can't disprove it, it's going to have an impact on you. Try to, try to prove that it's false. Try to prove that it's not true because I can prove that it's true. Ooh. <laughs> I can prove that it's true. I can prove that the same miracles that are here work right now are reproducible. Investigations on my side. What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to say away with him? Ah, uh, he was just a prophet. Ah, uh, he was a deceiver. What are you going to do with Jesus? Ah, uh, he was just a man. What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to say, oh, yes, he was the only begotten Son of God. And I believe that. Well, do you believe it enough to where that your heart and your life has changed so that you now begin to experience and benefit from all that He has given? Is there a changed heart? Is there, do you have the spirit of holiness? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Because I've got a lot of, I know a lot of people shake their head yes and tell me they love God, but they don't have the spirit of holiness. They have, a, they have pride and arrogancy and rebellion and stubbornness and evil speaking and sexual immorality and lust, and the pride of life and the, and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye dominates their life. That's not the spirit of holiness. That's not, you're, that, you're not, give me a break. you telling me that's what the Holy Ghost is doing? Give me a break. You need to change.
Well, I, I, I called upon the name of the Lord and I had a real experience. Yeah, but you're a perpetual backslider. When are you going to stop? You want to understand the consequences of perpetual backsliders? Say today, backslid tomorrow, say to next day, backslid the next day. Come on, you with me? Up and down, up and down. Like, like, a, like a person tossed to and back and forth by the waves. God says, think, I'm not going to give that person anything. That's what he said. That's what he said. That's what he said. Israel is an example of continual backsliding. Right one day, wrong the next. You better get right. Christ Jesus is coming. You better get right. He's coming to judge both the living and the dead. You better get right. You better, you better understand that your favorite preacher is not necessarily right. God's word's right. Huh? You better understand what he's going to hold you responsible for. You want to get it right. Paul describing salvation in Titus chapter 3 really, in some respects, amplifies a bit what uh, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3. But in, in Titus chapter 3, Paul says in verse 4, but after the kindness of and then beautiful, the kindness of God. Are you a beneficiary of the kindness of God? Yes. Have you experienced his kindness? Yes. He's, he's indescribable. His love and his mercy is amazing. To, to know him. Uh, my, my, my. Is to find a place of love relationship that produces the greatest kind of devotion and commitment. I've never cheated on my wife because I love her. And I'm not going to cheat on God because I love Him. And He filled me with this love. It's a wonderful love. Mm. Oh, that all men could understand this. Oh, that everyone would just be willing to step out and hearken unto the voice of the living God and say, okay, God, I want it your way. I know wrongdoing is wrong and there's no justifiable reason that it could ever be excused. People got a false doctrine that, oh, we're all sinners and we're all going to sin more or less every day. God said every sinner will have his part in the lake of fire. Yes, he, did. he said every liar will have his part in the lake of fire. He said, let no one who produce, participates in any kind of immorality think that they have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. And he names all that immorality over and again. Let nobody think that they can walk around speaking evil of people and living and bickering and fussing and strife and taking up an accusation against God's anointed, his people, his ministry, and think that they can be right with God. And then when people have so been indoctrinated that we sin more or less every day and it's okay because we're all just a bunch of sinners and God understands. Now your heart is hardened and you can't respond to the conviction of the Holy Ghost and repent. Because if you just repented, there would be the love and the mercy of God to cleanse you and wash you. But because you bought into a lie, you're going to be damned. He that believes a lie is damned. Truth such three. God's mercy and loving kindness is such that you could do him wrong over and over and over again. He'll continue to forgive you. And if you're sincere and you're right in your heart when you're asking for forgiveness, it ain't going to be long and you're going to be changed. And whatever it was that you were repenting over and whatever it was you constantly were stumbling into is going to come to an end. Are you with me? If it's going on for years, you never got real with God. You've never been changed. Spirit of the Son doesn't want anything but the will of the Father. Jesus said, everybody who says, Lord, Lord's not coming in. There's a bunch of people saying, Lord, Lord. There was that way in Israel. It's that way today in the church. Lord, Lord. They're saying, Jesus is my Lord. No, he's not your Lord. You don't, do his com you don't do what he said to do. And because you've now justified yourself, you can't come under Holy Ghost conviction when the Word of God goes forth. And through that Holy Ghost conviction, then through, 
have the pro production, as it were, of godly sorrow. Holy Ghost conviction producing godly sorrow that leads you to repentance, the goodness of God. Father's made it really easy. Is men, men are stubborn and rebellious and prideful. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And he'll, he'll save us. He'll save us. Save us from our condition and our sin and our wrongdoing and our evil speaking. He'll save us from sickness and disease. He'll cure us spiritually, physically, financially. Paul said in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 that God's kindness and the love of God didn't come to us because of the works of our righteousness. Because we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were enemies. Enemies of God. Paul said we were enemies by wicked works. Wicked works and the activity of wicked works still leaves people in a state of being the enemy of God. While we're yet the enemies of God, alienated from God, Christ died for us so that we could be redeemed and no longer be enemies but friends. But if you continue on in the deeds of iniquity, you enemy by definition Old and New Testament. And men don't want to believe that today. But the Bible tells us that in the, in the last days there would be perilous times. The world would be filled with doctrines of devils, seducing spirits, deceiving men, and deceivers that were continually being deceived and continually then being instruments of deception. How can I prove what's right and what's wrong? The Word of God. Is that what God's Word says? Is that, is, that his, is that truth in His Word? Do I need a whole bunch of theologians come alongside of me, help me understand the verse of Scripture, or could I be like a little child and understand it? Huh? I'm a theologian. I have my degree as a theologian. I'm going to tell you right now, I read the Bible just like a little child. I lay all that stuff aside. I just read the Bible like a little child. Here's what God said. He's speaking to the simplest person. Not speaking to the intellect. speaking to the heart. Huh? You go all you want, guys, and try to convince that girl that she should marry you. You can give her all the reasons and explanations why. Something's going to have to happen in her heart for her to say yes. Something's going to have to happen emotionally, huh? deep inside. Can't even, can't, there's no way to quantitate it. There's no way to analyze it. Something's got to happen apart from all of that which the, 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 the mind can measure for her to say, yeah. <laughs> There's a whole lot more going on about you than you've ever realized. There's a whole lot more going on to your decision-making, your attitudes, your emotions than you've ever thought about. I pray you get serious with your life. I pray you get serious with the life that God has for you. Get serious with the privilege of walking through the open door of Christ Jesus. I will not justify myself. I watch religious people justify themselves all the time. I will not justify myself. I'll fall down on my face and I'll let him alone justify me. And I'll have the evidence and the proof that I am the recipient of that justification. And if any man of God comes and speaks in my life and says, you are wrong, that is wrong. I'm going to get corrected as soon as I see the Word of God. And I'm going to repent. I'm not going to be stubborn and say, oh, no, I'm right, you wrong. Because all that is is deception, pride of life, arrogance, stubbornness, rebellion. Don't do that. That's a realm. That is a realm that will keep you in prison for all of eternity. I'm going to finish reading this scripture, but I want to say this. The difference between religion... And relationship is His manifest presence. And His manifest presence will keep you from sin. And His manifest presence will fill you with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And His manifest presence is a tangible peace that overwhelms every part of your being so that you do not fear nor worry nor want. Hallelujah. His manifest presence is a love. It's a love of Christ. 
where you can stand for 30 years and patiently speak to people who will not hear. Hallelujah. The pastoral ministries. People who are set on doing it their own way. But you know what? God gives every person the privilege of choosing. But I'm going to tell you what they're, what's going to happen. God always does this. He will always have a people who will hear. If you do not, if you do not falter, if you do not waver, if you continue to sow, and you do not weary in well-doing, you shall reap. There will be a mighty moving of the Spirit of the living God in Southern California and in this nation again. There will be. There will be shouting and leaping and, and, and dances of joy. The things that took place with Mariah Woodworth Etter, who was constantly visiting heaven back in the early 1900s here in the United States of America, led a great revival. When the events of where they would bring, like when they brought a young child to her who is deaf and blind, who, is, uh, who was mentally deranged, who is, could not walk, Everything was wrong with that baby. His baby was barely alive. She took the baby in her hands. The baby instantly was healed, cured. The baby set the baby down. The baby walked around. The baby saw, was mute, spoke, deaf, heard. And those things haven't just, those things didn't stop then. They still go on today, but only through those people who live in the manifest presence of God. You live in the manifest presence of God, you don't have a problem with the preacher. You don't have a problem with the church. You don't have a problem. You, this is heaven, man. That's right. I can walk in any church and feel heaven. Because I felt heaven before I got there. <laughs> I don't walk into a church and feel hell. That's a demon power. My God damn it. He said, you feel heaven until you came to the church? You know why? What, that was a false peace. That was a false heaven. You came into church and light shone, shone on you. And those, devil, th those devils that made you feel that so false sense of peace in heaven, they had to leave. So crawl out to God and get right. Are you listening to me? It's true. It's true. It's true. Big difference between religion and relationships manifest presence of Jesus. Manifest presence of God. Religion can't have it. Religion, when you hear religion preach, it doesn't have a manifest presence. Jesus. When you hear religion pray, it doesn't have a manifest presence. When you hear religion sing, there's no manifest presence of Jesus. You feel about the same thing that you'd feel when John Lennon sing, sang some song about somebody or somebody else. <laughs> A kumbaya, camaraderie, feel good kind of whatever. And mistake that for the manifest presence. Now, the manifest presence is unmistakable. And once you've been around the manifest presence, you get hooked. You say, this is happy land. It's a land of peace. It's a land of everything I've ever wanted. All I've ever desired. The goodness of God is here to lead you to repentance so that you can have everything that the Bible describes beginning with the relationship with the Lord Jesus that is not some kind of subjective, touchy-feely thing. But it is a very real, clear, Interaction, provable, glorious in every way. God has that for you today. You can't enter into it till you've been born again. Can't ever enter into it till you've been born again. Father wants you to be born again today. Christ Jesus wants you to be born again. God is calling. He's saying, come up here. What will you do with Jesus? Paul says this. He says, he didn't do this because of the righteousness that we had done. There's nothing you could do to earn God. You could never earn God's favor and love. He did it because he loves. God so loved the world. 
that he gave his only begotten son. He made a way. He came and found us before we ever even called upon him. He said, behold, here I am. That's Christ Jesus. And the preacher, every time the preacher preaches, Christ Jesus is still calling out to the world saying, behold, here I am. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. There are so many people that go to church that are just weary and heavy laden. They've never come to the rest. All you that are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. And he's talking about a heavenly realm, a heavenly life, a relationship of his manifest presence where everything that you've ever wanted is now yours and you are complete in him and have room for nothing else. Not by any works of righteousness which we have done. but according to his mercy. Hallelujah. He saved us. Have you been saved? Somebody said, saved from what? You. <laughs> saved from what? Living under the control and the influence of demon spirits. Of lust and envy and strife, bickering and evil speaking and malice. The only time you can really feel fulfilled and pleasurable is associated with some lustful thing. Here it is. He saved us. Here's Paul's definition of being saved. Here's Paul's definition of being saved. By the washing of regeneration. Have you been regenerated? Because it is the same thing as being born again, being made a new creation, a new creature. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he said, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old things are gone. They passed away. They dead. They're gone. They passed away. When we say something, body has passed away. Huh? They not around anymore. <laughs> and behold, everything is new. And everything is of God. You have to ask, is everything going on in your life of God? The only way that will be possible. Well, you need to make an appointment with your pastor. Come talk to him then, if everything's of God in your life. Because you still haven't got things right with me. <clears throat> got to get things right with the pastor if they're going to be right with God. People don't believe that, but it's true. And people don't want to be held accountable. They didn't want the truth. Oh, oh no, we're feeling awkward now. Correction's going down. Oh, the, yeah, correction's going to go down. Because God corrects every son that he receives. He does. Don't be surprised if God's correct, correction, and guess who he's going to use to correct you? <laughs> That's what he's going to do. And then some people, oh, don't correct anybody because then they're not going to come back. It's your, it's your choice. Doors are unlocked. God gives every person a free will. I'm just going to do my job. I'm not going to pretend. I won't pretend for the sake of numbers, and what men call success, and whatever. Money or whatever people do. They just let people do whatever they want to do. And, and pretend that they're right. They're not right. You're not right. If you're not right, you're not right. You need to get right. The good thing is you can get right real quick. Somebody said, that's condemnation. No, it's not. It's an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the boss says, I'll give you a job, but you got to kind of work. He can't say, oh, oh, that's condemnation. Oh, it's an opportunity. <laughs> Some people's faith is, is like this. Tell the child, go in there, clean the room. And they said, now I see it spick and span by faith, and I don't want to touch it and yield to doubt. Nonsense, man. In faith. 
Faith without works is dead, being alone. Um. You want to get right with God? It's easy. He wants you to be born again. He wants to give you a new heart, new spirit. When you have a new heart, new spirit, you have his heart, his spirit. You feel about things the way he feels about them. You're sensitive and tender towards him. You're willing to learn to do good and refuse evil. Scripture says concerning Jesus, the diet of milk and honey shall he eat. Not spinach and green beans. <laughs> something tasty, something that you delight to take in and have. Sweet honey and milk. Yum. More. More. I dig some more. I want no spinach. Huh? Bell peppers and all that stuff. That's not for me. Honey, milk, yum. Sweet. Honey and the diet of the word, the diet of relationship, the diet of that which is good, not which you have choked down. Sit there till you eat it all. So that he might choose the good and refuse the evil. <laughs> Have you learned to choose the good and refuse the evil? Are you willing to learn? Are you learning? I think probably that would be the better category. <laughs> like, I'm learning to choose the good and refuse the evil. I'm a learning. That's, that's what's important. There's growth and the maturity, the commitment to it. To say, oh, we don't need to, well, that's wrong. You've never been regenerated. The spirit of the Son's not there. The spirit of the Father's not there. The spirit of truth's not there. The spirit from which He spoke and, and by which He did all that He did for us doesn't exist within us. If we could go on in our sin and justify that state and not want to be made right, and then to give ourselves to being right and living right. By the washing of regeneration. When you get, when you're made a new creation, when you're born again, you couldn't get any cleaner than what being born again can make you. What a scrubbing down. Huh? When you go into the, the, the shower, bath, whatever to clean up, well, you just get so clean. You can just get so clean. But when everything is made new, one day the heavens and the earth will be made new. He's going to recreate them again. The old is going to be destroyed and going to be removed. It's going to be burned up with fire. And behold, he's going to make a new earth. He's going to make a new heaven. Just like the one is now, but it's going to be brand new. And there will be only righteousness in it. And now I, today, am a living testimony of that. Today, I'm a living testimony that Christ, I want Christ Jesus to come and rule and reign because I'm letting him rule and reign over me personally, individually, right now. The actions do speak much louder than words. I want his sovereign and absolute rule over my life. I'll let his word rule me. Every man has the capacity and the will to say no to sin and wrongdoing. Get the leaven out and you're going to have heaven. True. Why not? Doesn't it sound good? It's just some people, they might gulp and swallow real hard when I start telling them that they got to live without their sin. I'm, I've got a lot to give up. You've got nothing to give up but more hell and torment and disease and sickness. We want you to come on over here in this life. If our gospel be hid, it's hid from those who are lost. And then the final thing he says, and the restoration or the renewing or the renewal of the Holy Ghost. Ooh, hallelujah. And when you begin to look at those first Holy Ghost meetings, my goodness, look at that Holy Ghost meeting there in Acts chapter 2. Clothing tongues of fire, rushing mighty wind, all staggering around like drunken men speaking in other languages. 
Ah, the joy, the exceeding great joy that is in his presence. Look at the seraphim as they fly. They never touch the ground. Look at the joy that is in his presence. Look at the ecstatic joy and the life forevermore that is there. That's eternal life. It's the, it's the quality of being around him. It's the quality of being with him. They can't be with him, cannot know him. Until you step through the door of Jesus. When you step in that door, <laughs> it's life and life more abundantly. It, it, it's every good thing that Christ Jesus described. It's every wonderful thing that belongs to an effulgency, an immeasurable flow of God's presence as Jesus described it when he said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of the Holy Ghost. Rivers of living water Thus he spake of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit. The manifest presence of the living God. Would you stand with me? Dear people, today, there's, there's no condemnation. Unless you, re unless you reject what God says, then you're already, you've already condemned. God's condemnation is rejection. There's nobody rejecting anyone here. God's rejecting no man. He would that all men be saved. He's opened up the door for everyone to come. But if you take correction as condemnation, then you know you've got yourself a serious spiritual problem. Because God demands correction. He demands us to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. And if you're not willing to come under authority, I watch as people jump from one place to the next. No, 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 no. That's just you trying to escape authority. Don't do that anymore. Come to the authority of the Word of God. Today I'm here. I'm not asking anybody to come under my authority. I'm asking you to come under the authority of the Word of God. I'm asking you to respond to those that call of God your heavenly Father, who demands that all men repent, who demands that we change. He said, if you love me, you will obey me. Then my Father will love you. That's what Jesus said. Did you know that? I know a lot of people memorize John chapter 3 and verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, but that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. But it seems rare that people have memorized John 4, 18, 19. If you love me, you'll obey me and keep my commandments. Then my Father will love you. His definition of love. God's love places a demand. He demands you to change. And you shouldn't be sad about it. Huh? Huh? You should be happy that he's made a way of escape for you. Like, this is good news, pastor, or you might just call me preacher. This is great news. I want to get right with God. I don't want my own way. I want his way. I want to come to understand the things that are described in the Bible. I want them to be a reality in my life, not a pretend or make-believe. I'm not going to ascribe to Christian philosophy that says it's some kind of esoteric, make-believe, positional something or other that nobody really experiences because that's just simply a lie. Because I'm a somebody that experiences it and I stand in a company of hundreds of thousands and millions and tens of millions and possibly hundreds of millions. If everybody who says that they know God and have been baptized in the Holy Ghost telling the truth, there's supposedly 750 million today on the earth right now. That's a lot of data points, isn't it? What will you do with Jesus today? What will you do with Jesus? Will you, will you call upon his name and allow God the Holy Ghost to change you so that you can now follow him? So that you can now please him and do what is right in the sight of the Father? What will you do with Jesus? He, Jesus, who would have all men to be saved.
I ask all of you to bow your heads right now and close your eyes. And I want you to ask yourself this one question. Are you right with God? Are you right according to the Scriptures? Are you the person that Christ Jesus died for you to be? And I want you to leave this place certain that you are. I want you to leave this place today certain that your life has been changed and that you're committed and consecrated to God for this, from this day for the rest of your life. And so I'm going to pray this prayer and I'm going to break off the strongholds of the powers of darkness because the Scripture says if our gospel be hid, it is hid from those who are lost, whom the God of this world is blinded. And so I'm going to break the stronghold of those mind-blinding spirits so that from this day forward, you'll be able to see it God's way and then be willing, therefore, to do it His way. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, every power of religion, every power of deception, every work of darkness, every satanic work of darkness, I break the stronghold of it now in Jesus' name. I release you from your prison. I open up your prison door. I set you free in Jesus' name. I proclaim liberty to you that from this day forward you can choose to walk with God and do what, what is right in His sight. In Jesus' mighty name. In the mighty name of Jesus. If you willing to respond to that prayer, just lift your hands towards heaven right now. If you're willing to respond to the call of God, if you're willing to call, respond to the voice of the living God who's speaking right out of heaven right now, just lift your hands towards heaven. Just lift your hands towards heaven because he said anybody who calls upon my name, they will be saved. And that means when you're saved, the power of the Holy Ghost will come upon you and the washing of regeneration will take place in your life. And I know there are many standing here right now with your hands lifted up and you know that that has already happened. There's, no wrong, there's nothing wrong with you continuing to lift your hands towards Him and let Him touch you and feel you and change you. Father, I thank You for these people that stand here in this place that are willing to know You and to walk with You and give their life completely over to that which You have willed that which you have called and commanded all men to come to, to know this wonderful relationship with you. Father, I thank you for the working of your divine power and grace. Father, I thank you that this place will be filled with people full of the Holy Ghost, excited about serving you and walking with you and knowing you, filled with the ability and the strength and the power to do those things which you have commanded. For Lord, we know that you both will and do of your good pleasure in us. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> ah, give a shout to the Lord. He's so good. Just set your voice and praise Him for a little while. Set your voice and praise Him. Father, we thank You that Your loving kindness is better than life. Blessed is Your holy name. Blessed is your holy name. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mighty power. We thank you for the change of life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, blessed is your name, Lord. Blessed is your name, Lord. Blessed is your name, Almighty God. Lord, we worship you. Your loving kindness, oh God, is better than life to me. Just worship, worship him. Worship him with me. Those of you who know the Lord... Worship Him. Those of you who know the living God, go ahead and interact with Him.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, living God. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we praise your holy name. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, we worship you. If there's anybody who wants prayer for anything, want prayer because you're not sure that you're right with God or you want to be right with God and you want someone to pray with you, if you've got sickness in your body, if you've got problems going on in your life, we're here to pray with you and for you. We know that the Lord will touch you, change you. He'll change the situation spiritually for you. If you don't know Him, a miracle of salvation will take place in your life and you'll know Him. His manifest presence will become real to you. If you got sickness in your body, come, the Lord will heal you. Sickness will go out of your body. The pain, the disease will depart from you. Any other needs whatsoever, just come. The Lord will touch you. Just come. While they're coming, the people are coming, I just want to give everybody an opportunity to come worship the Lord with their tithes and with their offerings. You give a gift to the Lord, He's going to give a bigger gift to you. You sow seed into the kingdom, He's going to multiply it. And He's going to cause all grace to abound unto you. He's made means by which we and I can have a miracle provision in our finances as well. It's not just praying over it. It's by sowing. He says, as you give, He said, He'll multiply it. He calls men to heap into your bosom. And as you sow generously, you also reap generously. So just come worship the Lord with your giving. Find people around you, hug them, bless them, tell them that you love them. Anybody else want prayer? You just come. We'll pray with you and for you. Anybody else want prayer? Just come. Come. 